brethren. And happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath to those of you that are joining with us on the live stream and various other media. For our opening song, for every stanza, the words that the song said, at the beginning it said, stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the strife will not be long. And the thought came to mind, for many of us, when we accepted the rod message, it was a stance that we had to take on our own. Friends may not have stood with us. Family members may not have stood with us. And though that time has passed and we are now in the message, there are still times when we will have to stand on our own for truth and righteousness. And so the topic that we will be looking, that we will be looking at this evening is entitled, Stand Alone for Truth and Righteousness. And for some of us, when we are standing alone, we may feel as if we are alone. But the thought also comes to my mind. What did the Lord say unto Elias in Romans chapter 11 when he thought that he was standing alone, that he was the only one that is left? Rightly so, the Lord said to him, I have reserved unto myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. So before we pray, I would like for us to consider this thought taken from 1 TG 37, page 11 to 13. It says, consider that when God called Abraham, though he was alone, he nevertheless obeyed and God blessed him. That in spite of all the apparent impossibilities with both him and Sarah, he increased him. Now the question is asked, what if you personally and alone were called by his word, as was Abraham, to stand alone for truth and righteousness? Would you be a hero for God, as was Abraham? That is a thought that we can contemplate on. It goes on to say, we are plainly told not to lose courage, but to have faith in God, for he intends to bless and increase us as he blessed and increased our ancestors, Abraham and Sarah. With these thoughts in mind, let us pray. Let us kneel for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, it's indeed an honor and a privilege to bow before you and to sit at your feet once more to learn of you and to hear from you. Dear Lord, we ask that you will open up our hearts and minds to the message that you have for us this evening, that our hearts will be receptive, and that we will continue to stand in your truth and for your truth and righteousness. We ask that you will continue to guide and protect your people wherever they may be at this time. We thank you so much for the Sabbath, and we pray that your Holy Spirit will be in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. In Isaiah, the 51st chapter, verses 1 and 2, it says, Hearken unto me, ye that follow after righteousness, ye that seek the Lord. Look unto the rock, whence ye are hewn, and to the hole of the pit, whence ye are digged. Look unto Abraham your father, and unto Sarah that bare you. For I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. 
God advises his people of the day to hearken unto him. There are those who are endeavoring to obtain righteousness, those who are seeking the Lord, and who are anxious to have a revival and reformation among them. So who is this people that the Lord is speaking to? We are. It said those who are fortunate enough to have this revelation brought to them are the people. They are now urged to look to the rock whence they are hewn and to the hole of the pit whence they are digged. We are the ones that are fortunate to have this truth. Hence the Lord is speaking to us. We are the ones that are seeking to obtain righteousness. And so there is a reason that the Lord is saying unto us tonight, look unto Abraham your father. It says the message came. The message of God came to Abraham. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. In order that God might qualify him for his great work as the keeper of the sacred oracles, Abraham must be separated from the associations of his early life. The influence of kindred and friends would interfere with the training which the Lord purposed to give his servant. His character must be peculiar, different from all the world. He could not even explain his course of action so as to be understood by his friends. Spiritual things, spiritual things are spiritually discerned, and his motives and actions were not comprehended by his idolatrous kindred. The Lord sent Abraham a message that he was to hear, and Abraham was to be the keeper of the sacred oracles. He was to be a peculiar person set apart for the work of the Lord. As a result, he had to be separated from associations of his early life, not to be influenced by their idolatrous acts. And so here we see that Abraham, when that message came to him, he had to take a stand for truth and righteousness. A promise was given. There was given to Abraham the promise, especially dear to the people of that age, of numerous pos posterity and of national greatness. I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And to this was added the precious assurance, sorry, and to this was added the assurance, precious above every other to the inheritor of faith, that of his line, the redeemer of the world should be blessed. And so the work that the Lord was calling Abraham to, what he sought to do through Abraham, was it just for Abraham alone? Absolutely not. Whenever the Lord does something through us or even for us, it's never just for us alone. It goes on to say, a sacrifice demanded. Yet as the first condition of fulfillment, there was to be a test of faith. A sacrifice was demanded. It was no light test that was thus brought upon Abraham, no small sacrifice that was required of him. There were strong ties that bind him to his country, his kindred, and his home. But he did not hesitate to obey the, obey the call. God has spoken, his servant must obey. The happiest place on earth for him was the place where God would have him to be. Did Abraham make that sacrifice? And was it a small sacrifice? No, it says there were strong ties that bind him to his country, his kindred, and his home. But the one thing that stood out here is that he obeyed the one voice. He said to himself, God had spoken, 
his servant must obey. And though he was called to perhaps a life of struggles and difficulties and perplexities, the happiest place on earth for him was the place where God would have him to be. That is a lesson for all of us. It says, stand alone for truth and righteousness. With only the naked promise that his descendants should possess Canaan, without the least evidence, he followed on where God should lead, fully and sincerely complying with the conditions on his part, and confident that the Lord would faithfully perform his word. The patriarch went wherever God indicated his duty. He went confidently. He trusted in the Lord. Here we see that Abraham knew the righteousness of God because he had that trust. It says the patriarch went wherever God indicated his duty. He passed through wilderness without terror. He went among idolatrous nations with one thought, and that one thought was God has spoken. I am obeying his voice. He will guide. He will protect me. Are we concerned that in doing our work as to whether or not the Lord will protect us from the virus, from the vaccine, from unpleasant conditions? And what if the Lord allows it? Would we say that we are not under his protection because he allows it? Abraham thought to himself, the one thought ringing in his mind was God has spoken, I am obeying his voice. He will guide, he will protect me. And so he went wherever the Lord told him to go. Still tested as was Abraham. Many are still tested as was Abraham. They do not hear the voice of God speaking directly from the heavens, but he calls them by the teaching of his word and the events of his providence. We looked at Abraham. Now we are going to forward to our day. The message came. It says the message totals over 2,878 2, pages of literature published since 1930, taken from track one. The shepherd's rod takes its name from Moses' rod, the instrument through which the Lord manifested his power in the deliverance of the children of Israel. The shepherd's rod, the only rod that has ever spoken, is predicted and recommended in Micah 6, 9. Hear ye the rod and him who hath appointed it. And so here we see that the Lord sent us a message that we are required to hear. And by God's grace, we are here. And so that means that we did hear the message, but we cannot stop there. We have to continue to do so and continue to apply the principles of that message in our lives. A promise given. Through the message of the Lord, there are many promises that the Lord has given to us as his people. But the one that I would like for us to focus on is taken from Ezekiel 20. Ezekiel 20 gives us a prophetic view of the children of Israel from the time that they sojourned, from the time that they sojourned in Egypt to the time of the sealing of the 144,000 and to the gathering of the people. I would like for us to focus on verse 37. Here it says, here Christ is, the Lord is speaking to his people, and he says, I will cause you to pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. The statement of Ezekiel 20, verse 37, to pass under the rod, therefore means to separate his very elect from among the multitude, from among the tears, or from among the bad fish. And being thus separated, they are counted. So it is that the 144,000 are a separate and numbered company. My question tonight is, could we have passed under the rod 
before 1930. No one could have passed under the rod before 1930 because the message has not yet come. But now that it is here, and now that we have accepted, we are now being passed under the rod. And the Lord is saying in doing so, he would bring us into the bond of the covenant. When God causes his people to thus pass under the rod, he will bring them into the bond of the covenant, which he made with Abraham, and of his oath unto Isaac, and had confirmed the same to Jacob for a law, and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan, the lot of your inheritance. We say that we have a kingdom that we are going to, that we are looking forward to. Are we allowing ourselves to pass under the rod? It says, The promises which they fail to realize, the Lord assures that he will now let his people have them. 2 TG 1, page 7. That which the Lord sought to accomplish in the past, he is saying that he will accomplish it today. And how fortunate we are to be a part of the association that he will accomplish it true, through. We hear this all the time. Right now, the Lord is advertising for at least 144,000 lifesavers with headquarters on famous Mount Zion. The Lord promised Abraham, gave a promise to Abraham that was dear to the people of that age, one of national greatness. Isn't this for us at this time, one of national greatness? Will there be anyone on this earth higher than the 144,000? Never the like. And so the Lord is saying to us, strive with all our might to either be one of or one with. Either way, when this message came to us, it was not by chance. And so even though we may not be one off, we have the privilege to at least be one with. At the same time, sacrifice demanded. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. It says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Christ is here saying to us, if we are seeking him, it comes with a price. We need to lay down self. We need to lay down our cherished thoughts, our desires, the things that we would have hoped for and dreamed of in life. You know, growing up as a child, you hear things like, Go to school and get a good education and don't be as poor as, as I am from your parents. Make a better life for yourself. And then at the same time, you realize that the Lord is not calling us to the riches of this world. He's calling us to something much greater. And so if he decides to pull from us, to take away from us the riches of this world, what will we do? And so it says, deny self, take up the cross, take up our God-given duty, and follow on wherever the Lord will lead. That's all he's requiring of his people today. And we profess to be that people, what would we do? Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man had found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath and buy at that field. Matthew 13, verse 44. Those who will gain entrance into the kingdom are here represented as searchers of, a, of great treasure. And when, and when they find its location, the field, they are very eager to make it their own. They are certain of its worth, and count it not a risk to sell all they possess, whether much or little, to obtain the kingdom. They sell, of course, what they sell, of course, 
is not only lands or houses, but anything which, if not disposed of, would keep them out of the kingdom. I believe that each and every one of us within the within here and within here in my voice and here in this reading we know whatever it is that we need to let go of we know what it is that we may be holding on to that if Christ's kingdom was to be being set up today tonight tomorrow we can tell right now as to whether or not we would be in that kingdom as to whether or not we would make it and so we have a choice inspiration is given us a choice because it's not by force it says hearing and obeying the one voice just such faith and confidence as Abraham had the messengers of God need today but many whom the Lord could use will not move onward hearing and obeying the one voice above all others the connection with kindred and friends the former habits and association too often have so great an influence upon God's servants that he can give them but little instruction can communicate to them but little knowledge of his purposes the Lord will do much more for his servants if they were wholly consecrated to him esteeming his service above the times of kindred and all other earthly associations do we place family members above the Lord do we place children husbands wife above what he's calling us to is that connection so strong that we are afraid to go full fully ahead that cannot be the Lord is asking for holy for us to be wholly consecrated so the question is asked again what if you personally and alone were called by his word as was Abraham to stand alone for truth and righteousness would you be a hero for God as was Abraham that is something that we have to decide on our own though we have already accepted this message as time continues we will have to take a stand seemingly all over again because the way is getting narrow and rough point of reflection when we think about this association that we are a part of the Davidian Seventh-day Adventist Association I believe that it's a privilege for us to be a member of this association when we think to ourselves that it is to bring about among God's people that reformation called for in the testimonies for the church volume 9 page 126 when we come to the realization that this association is dedicated to the work of announcing and bringing forth the restoration as predicted in Hosea 1 11, 3, 5 of God's of, da of David's kingdom in antitype when we realize that it purports itself to to be the first of the first fruits of the living the vanguard from among the present-day descendants of those Jews who composed the early Christian church when we reflect upon these points as brought forth to us from the Leviticus do we realize our high calling that we are a part of the association that brings about all these things who will do it who makes up the association is the people we do and so we cannot put it just as a name and leave it right there but we have to realize that it is us once we are fully dedicated to the cause of Christ when we realize that with a loud cry it is to go into the highways and hedges preaching the everlasting gospel unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people when it gets this new name that's a high calling and so when we reflect and we think about what last year has been 
2020 and we are now in 2021. What has our life been like as a member of this association that is to accomplish all these great things? Are we standing for truth and righteousness? Did we give our best to the master for the year of 2020? Or have we become weary? Does a promise for some reason seem too far off? And we settled back into our life of our own way comfortably? Do we realize that we are on the last mile home? The mile that is going to be the most difficult that we have ever trod before, no matter how long we've been a part of this truth. Very soon, because time is short, and we know time is short because we've heard it over and over again, and so very soon we, once we are following on in this truth, will be called to stand before state, statesmen, rulers of this earth, government, what will we do? Do we realize that even from the intensity of the class that we are in, that we are only now, though we've been through a lot and we've sacrificed a lot, we are only now being urged into a conflict? Said Martin Luther a few years after the opening of the Reformation, God does not guide me. He pushes me forward. He carries me away. I am not master of myself. I desire to live in repose, but I am thrown into the midst of tumults and revolutions. He was now about to be urged into the contest. What do we expect 2021 to be like? Following on in the truth of the Lord. Is it possible that we desire repose? Do we realize that it just might be that we are about to be thrown into the midst of tumults and revelation and revolutions that we are, that we're that we are about to be urged into the contest against evil? And so, if we give ourselves to the Lord. No matter what we desire, if we put our hands in his and put our will on his side, we would realize that we are not master of ourselves. He would do whatever it is that he wants to do through us. We pick up from Isaiah 51 verse 7. The Lord says, Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness, the people in whose hearts is my law, Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revelings. Those who know this truth, the people to whom this truth is revealed, and who have his law in their hearts, obviously will suffer from reproach and revelings of men. But they are admonished not to fear. To the reproaches of his enemies who taunted him with weakness, with the weakness of his cause, Luther answered, Who knows if God has not chosen and called me to perform this needed work? If these babblers, babblers ought not to fear that by despising me they despise God himself, they say I am alone. No, for Jehovah is with me. In their sense, Moses was alone at the departure from Egypt. Elijah was alone in the reign of King Ahab. Isaiah was alone in Jerusalem. Ezekiel was alone in Babylon. Hear this, O Rome. God never selected as a prophet either the high priest or any great personage, but rather he chose low and despised men, once even the shepherd Amos. In every age the saints have been compelled to rebuke kings, princes, recurrent priests and wise men at the peril of their lives. I do, not say that I, also, I do not say that I also am a prophet, but I do say that they ought to fear precisely because I am alone. While on one side, while on the side of the opposer are numbers, caste, wealth, and mocking letters, yes, I am alone. 
but I stand serene because side by side with me is the word of God. And with all their boasted numbers, this the greatest of powers is not with them. We have to know which side we are on. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the, to give you the kingdom. It is a work of faith to calmly repose in God in the darkest hour, however severely tried and tempest-tossed, to feel that our Heavenly Father is at the helm. And so we are counseled to be strong in the Lord. How often do we tug at the oars as though our own strength and wisdom was sufficient until we find our efforts useless? Then with trembling hands and failing strength, we give up the work to Jesus and confess we are unable to perform it. Our compassionate Redeemer pities our weakness, and when in answer to the cry of faith, he takes up the work we ask him to do, how easily he accomplished that which seemed to us so difficult. That which seems to us so difficult is easy to the Lord. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, and, and ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, stand. Is it possible that we would be able to stand if we have not done all it takes to stand? And so the question is, that I ask to myself, why do I expect to stand and wonder why I'm falling and failing in the things that the Lord is asking me to do when I know to myself that I'm not doing all that he said that I should do, that I might stand? Because if I was, I would stand. And it's not that we're doing it on our own. We're doing it through him. What will it take to stand? God's messengers must tarry long with him if they would have success in their work. We know that the Lord said that this work would not fail. For if it fails, every soul on this earth will be lost. But for, uh, for us to have success in this work, we must tarry long with him. Doing that by guarding jealously our hours for prayer and self-examination. It says, set apart some portion of each day for study of the scriptures and communion with God. Thus you will obtain spiritual strength and grow in grace and favor with God. It's nothing new that we are reading here. We are, we are reminded of this all the time, but do we find the time to do it? No, we are left on our own to do it because we were, be, we were, be, we were given practice in the class. No, we are left on our own to find that time through a busy schedule, as hectic as the day may be, to set, a, to set apart that time with the Lord. It says, the time devoted to the study of God's word and to prayer will bring a hundredfold return. And so we know the work that the Lord is seeking to do is not just for us, but he's seeking to bring the gospel to every nation, tongue, and people. He's seeking to bring in a great multitude. He's seeking to bring a hundredfold And so we're concluding, stand wholly consecrated. Forgetting the things that are behind, let us press forward in the heavenward way. Let us neglect no opportunity that, if improved, will make us more useful in God's service. Then, like, thro like threads of gold, holiness will run through our lives 
and the angels beholding our consecration will repeat the promise, I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. And so may the Lord bless us and help us to keep standing for truth and righteousness and for those of us who are perhaps hiding or contemplating to ourselves as to whether we should take a stand or struggling with something, may he help us to give that up and take our stands, come to the forefront and stand for truth and righteousness. God bless.